<laughs> it should be not now. <laughs> All right, here we go. We are all set here. Um, just give me one second to share. Oops. Okay, um, well, I just want to say welcome to everyone. Um, it's so great to have uh, everybody here this evening. Um, I'm Odette Ramos. I'm the uh, city councilwoman for the 14th district in Baltimore City. Uh, very excited to uh, be doing these town halls again. Um, they're a lot of fun and uh, I took the summer off. So now we're, you know, back again. And um, last uh, week we had a Hispanic Heritage Month celebration and we're gonna do the same this week. So I'm totally excited about it, but let me give you a few updates before uh, we continue. The uh, first thing is um, you all probably already know that uh, they're gonna start charging you or have started charging you for your bags at the grocery store or at other places. So we want you to bring your reusable bags um, the ones that are canvas, they can be different material, but just bring your own bags. And uh, if you need one, please call our office. Uh, we're also going to be doing bag distribution at the Waverly Giant um, in a couple of weeks. So we'll let everybody know about that. Um, the Baltimore Marathon is coming through on Saturday. So just don't go anywhere on Saturday morning. Uh, we It goes through my district about three different times. Um, so just enjoy the beautiful day, cheer on the runners, um, and uh, it's always a lot of fun. Um, it goes around up through Clifton Park, around Lake Montebello, 33rd Street, uh, down through um, uh, Charles Village, and then there's also part of it that comes from Druid Hill Park and then goes down through Charles Village. So there's a lot going on that day. Um, also, uh, on October 16th, we have our first annual um, District 14 job fair, uh, where uh, if somebody needs a job, we've got employers from the district and even from outside the district that will be there, including um, Carol Fuel and the uh, Y, um, uh, Dream Management, uh, which is a Latino owned business. Um, we have also the post office, they are hiring and we need people. So we uh, hope that uh, you all can um, join us for that. So those are my uh, reminders. Um, and now we wanna get to the main event here. Um, again, I'm just excited to be able to um, feature a uh, uh, really uh, great work that's being done in the city by the by Latino community. So I'm just excited to feature a few more um, folks that have been doing some great work. Um, Catalina Rodriguez Lima, she is uh, the with the executive director of the mayor's office of immigrant affairs, very important um, work being done there. And then um, Marjorie Nemes from Latino Economic Development Corporation, along with Walda Jan and uh, Omar Velasco. And I'm just so thrilled that all of you are here. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having us. Yeah, it's so great to see you. So I'm going to ask first for each of you to just kind of talk a little bit about yourselves and uh, what your organization does. Um, we're going to talk about a little bit about COVID later, um, but just want to get the, the basics of, of everything that you do. So, um, Catalina, you want to start? Sure. Thank you so much, Councilwoman Ramos, uh, for the opportunity and for all the work and advocacy on behalf of the Latino community. It's great to join all my colleagues from LEBC. They're one of my, one of my favorite uh, nonprofits in the city. Um, so again, I am Catalina Rodriguez Lima. I'm the founding director of the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. I am an immigrant from Ecuador uh, and I started in the Mayor's Office under the Rawlings Blake administration as the Latino liaison under the Office of Neighborhoods. Um, I soon realized that a lot of the issues that our communities face um, were systematic issues. And because of that, in 2013, I proposed this idea of creating a cabinet level office uh, of immigrant affairs that could address the overarching needs 
of Latino immigrants, but also other immigrants that were facing similar barriers. In 2014, uh, we were created. Um, and our mission is to promote the economic growth, community well being, and the integration of the close to 50,000 foreign born individuals living in the city of Baltimore. The majority of immigrants are Latinos. Um, so a lot of our work is related in, around the Latino community. Um, some of our roles as an office is to advise the mayor, cabinet, uh, senior staff. We also serve as a source of information for our communities. Our communities do not read the sun or watch WJC 13. Um, we take our role as a communicator very serious. We have a series of communication channels in partnership with ethnic media, social media, nonprofit organizations. Um, we also provide a lot of technical assistance for city agencies. Ideally, we won't exist because agencies are often thinking about immigrants. Well, that's not the reality. So we are the squeaky wheel that's often asking and advocating to make sure to making sure that services and resources do not have any barriers related to language, immigrant status, or the ability to access technology. Um, within that role, we also do a lot of advocacy to make sure that public funding and private funding is reaching nonprofit organizations um, serving our constituents. We manage the city's language access program, which actually works with city agencies to make sure that they have access to telephonic interpretation, translation of documents, and training on how to work with the close to 21,000 people who can't speak English, and which, by the way, half of them are Spanish speakers. And then finally, we respond to the needs of immigrants based on changes at the federal level. And so under the Trump administration, our focus was on expanding access to legal services. Under the Biden administration, things have changed, luckily. Um, and it's been more about creating our own local resources so that our residents can access federal benefits that unfortunately do not come with operational dollars. You have a, a huge task because um, as you said, the immigrant uh, community isn't just Latino. There's so many people coming to Baltimore. So I know some of your documents are translated in four or five languages at the moment, right? That's correct. The city's uh, five core languages are Spanish, Mandarin, Korean, French, and Arabic. Although the languages in our school system are different. Um, mm -hmm. Those are more like Trigenia, Arabic, um, Somalian, yeah, well, and that's a function of Baltimore being one of the resettlement cities, correct? So that's correct. Uh, mm -hmm. The city of Baltimore, um, through the International Rescue Committee, resettles approximately 800 refugees per year to the Baltimore region. This next fiscal year, because of the crisis in Afghanistan, we're expecting an additional 600 uh, um, Afghan evacuees to come to the region for a total oh. of close to 1,300 uh, refugees, SIV holders, or evacuees. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's that's a lot of people. And so there's a lot of people speaking different languages. And, you know, it's still the case that I don't, I don't think our city's ready for that, right? We never had to worry about that until recently. And so um, I think, uh, you know, the, the work of translating is important, but advocating that people and, and our agencies are actually thinking about people who speak different languages and different cultures, right? Because not everybody who comes to the US came from a country that has trust in the governments and, you know, all of that. So, you know, that's also part of it is probably just being training people on what those sensitivities might have to be. Yeah, ideally, um, as I mentioned earlier, our office wouldn't exist. Uh, because agencies are thinking about this, but for now it is still an afterthought. So our job is also to change the culture across city agencies. Um, through language access and through equity, we have found some intervention mechanisms to make sure that they're constantly thinking about translation, cultural appropriateness, um, capacity. And if we don't have it, something that we have done in the past is uh, subcontract subcontract with nonprofit organizations, which in my opinion, in some cases, it's much better than trying to build it in local government uh, because of this notion of fear, uh, particularly after the Trump administration, 
immigrants are really afraid of contacting government. So something that we've done um, over the last few years is subcontract with nonprofit organizations that have trust, that they have built the trust, they have the capacity, they have the human capital, um, and they are perhaps a better conduit than we are uh, in delivering services. Mm -hmm. Right, and so some of the groups include LEDC, who we're gonna talk with next, as well as um, Esperanza Center, and uh, so um, CASA, and uh, you know several others, uh, Southeast CDC as well, um, which is a great organization. So, um, and then you know our community is growing, right? We have, we, you know, 70, 80 percent increase <laughs> in the Latino community. Some immigrants, some people coming from other parts of the U.S. or from Puerto Rico, because you know can't, we're not really considered immigrants. Um, so uh, that is uh, really important. Right, so we have to get ready. <laughs> Baltimore's not ready, <laughs> so yeah. So, and your work is helping us do that. So, thank you. Uh, so, Marjorie, tell us a little bit about LEDC. I'm so excited that LEDC is here in Baltimore, and you know, doing just really amazing work. So, tell us a little bit about about what's happening. Sure. Um, I have a slide, or I have some slides, but I'm not sure. Oh, sure. Let me share uh, them here. Yep. Yep. Let me do that. Hold on one second. Okay. You should be able to now. Okay. Let's see. That'd be great. Awesome. So yeah, so LEDC, uh, I'm Marjorie Nemes, I'm the Interim Executive Director and CEO, and I'm here with my colleagues, um, Walda Yon and Omar Velasco. Walda is our Chief of Housing, uh, and Omar is our Chief for Small Business Services and Lending. Um, LEDC is a 30-year-old organization. We're a nonprofit. We actually were created in response to riots that broke out in Washington, D.C. as a result of a police brutality incident. Um, which you know we see today. So uh, LEDC grew out of a movement. There were a group of Latino advocates um, that had been advocating for the Latino community for some time, and you know the riot was a straw that broke the camel's back. Um, and LEDC moved to, I mean, DC government moved to figure out how to support um, the Latino community, and you know got these advocates together, handed them some money, and said, "We'll do something about it." Right. And so uh, these advocates decided to. Uh, one of the ways they decided to um, support the Latino community was to create the Latino Economic Development Center, right? And to focus on small business development uh, and housing services. And so we're 30 years old, uh, we're woman led, we've been woman led for the last 10 years. Our executive team is 80% female. Um, we're certified by a number of um, federal agencies, the US Treasury Department, Small Business Administration, uh, the USDA, we're a HUD certified housing counseling agency. And we were brought to the city by your, uh, very own Catalina Rodriguez, who's here. Um, back in 2014, Catalina fought uh, to bring us uh, to Baltimore. She heard about our work in DC and in the DMV region. Um, so we've been here since. Uh, and without her, uh, I, I don't see how we would have made it um, in Baltimore. She, she is our, our champion. Um, we serve over 6,000 residents a year. Because of COVID, um, this increased uh, significantly well over 8,000 um, in 2020. Uh, our mission is to drive the economic and social advancement of low to moderate income Latinos and other underserved communities in DC, Maryland, Virginia, and Puerto Rico uh, by equipping them with the skills and tools to build assets, achieve financial independence, and become leaders in their communities. Uh, we have offices obviously in Baltimore City, DC, Montgomery County, uh, and Arlington. And the you know two big sides of our house, as I said, are our small business programs um, and our housing programs. So uh, I'll let Omar and, and Wanda get into that into greater depth, but we're doing uh, small business advisory services in group settings, as well as in one-on-one -on -one settings. We're providing financing, and in Baltimore City in particular, we're actually doing facade work um, on Broadway, which we started about a year ago, yeah. Um, and then on the housing side in, in Baltimore City, we're doing housing counseling, uh, which includes uh, purchasing your first home for closure prevention, and we also had to start doing eviction prevention um, due to COVID. In terms of our impact, uh, we've deployed uh, over 28 million um, in the form of over 2,000 small business loans in DC, Maryland, Virginia, and Puerto Rico. Uh, we serve over 
well over 1,300 entrepreneurs a year, right, through our longstanding programming, as well as a new program that we started in 2017 or acquired, uh, which is focused on women entrepreneurs. Um, over the past two completed fiscal years, this is not including 2021, uh, we served over 5,500 um, aspiring and existing small business owners through our one-on-one -on -one, uh, coaching and our group trainings. We deployed almost 400 loans, uh, totaling about $7 million. And these efforts uh, resulted in the creation of 150 businesses, the retention of over 1,300 jobs, and the creation um, of an estimated 430 um, full-time equivalent jobs. And then on, the, on our housing side, our team served almost 4,000 residents uh, with their housing services, um, financial capability, rental and homeownership counseling services. Uh, they provided, um, they also provided one-on-one -on -one, uh, housing counseling, which resulted in 202 uh, families investing over 43 million in, in, purchasing, in the purchasing of their first home in, in really inaccessible markets, right? So they're doing great work to make sure that folks are prepared um, to acquire really valuable um, assets. Uh, and the team also helps folks um, with down payment assistance programs. And you know, over the past two years, they help these families acquire almost $4 million um, in down payment assistance and closing cost. Uh, and the team also during COVID ventured into this new area of helping deploy financial assistance grants. And so they were able to get um, financial assistance into the hands of over 300 families um, via the landlords, because that's how the program is designed, but it's a, it's a pretty complex process. Um, so it, it takes a lot of work, uh, but I'll turn it over to Omar and then um, to go into our small business work and then uh, one that can talk about our housing work. Thank you, Marjorie. So yeah, so we have two big uh, services for uh, aspiring business owners and established businesses. One is uh, advisory services, one-on-one uh, -on -one, as Marjorie said, and also uh, group trainings. And we have also the access to capital portion. Um, so basically we are a one-stop shop where entrepreneurs can find everything uh, that they need to be equipped to, to start or to grow their business. Um, we also uh, have a credit building program. So for uh, especially uh, credit invisible individuals, so in, uh, individuals that uh, came to, to the US and they probably had a, uh, uh, credit history in their countries, but here they have to start from scratch. We have a program to offer financial literacy and also uh, a small in, uh, consumer loans to start building credit. Um, we uh, also have a, a women-focused uh, entrepreneurship program uh, in Baltimore City specifically. We have done two uh, cohorts so far, and we also have a, a business accelerator program in West Baltimore, where we serve established businesses, uh, thanks to the sponsorship of uh, Kaiser Permanente and Bon Secours. Um, we serve around uh, 150 uh, business owners every year. Uh, we provide around 18 uh, workshops uh, free of charge. And we also provide around uh, 25 to 30 uh, loans every year in, in Baltimore City specifically. So yeah, that's uh, basically in a nutshell. We also have um, a program in um, in the Broadway corridor. Uh, it's, it's our, our first uh, uh, project managing a facade improvement uh, uh, initiative. Uh, as you know, so in, in the Fells Point area, there are like two, two um, kind of um, zones. One is the, the area closer to the uh, waterfront, which is well-developed, uh, thriving. And the other area is upper uh, the Broadway Street or, or upper Fells Point, where uh, there, are, there are a lot of um, uh, businesses, uh, like very diverse uh, um, in terms of the, the, the ownership, like businesses from Yemen, businesses from uh, uh, business owners from from Africa, uh, Latino businesses, and and they um, right now are experiencing uh, like uh, some sort of gentrification due to the the rapid development of 
projects in, in that area and they need to uh, like keep up and, and maintain their, their businesses to um, fight this uh, potential displacement and, and having a, a good facade, having a good business model and having a good menu of services, uh, we, we hope it's, it's gonna help them thrive and continue uh, being in that area. Thank you. So the, the, uh, that program, so there's the Fells Point Main Street, which is gonna be closer to the water and then you work um, up a little bit farther up. Yeah, correct. Right, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, that's very exciting. This is this is really exciting um, because there's so, particularly after COVID or even during COVID, there were there's so many more people that are wanting to start up their own business, right? And so I would imagine that you know you're going to get a bump up of uh, people interested in your entrepreneurship training, um, or already have, um, and then. The small business lending is really critical because so many people want to start up a business but can't get financing unless they, um, you know, have credit. And so, you know, even your micro loan uh, program uh, is is extremely important. And I have a, I have a business in my district that is interested in doing that. So I'll um, connect you all because uh, we do need. There's a couple of places in our district that. Just just need, you know, people just need to do micro loans initially. And I know it's really hard. <laughs> it's like a lot of work for with a little bit, but um, it's, it's really important. So um, your, your consumer lending and credit building is going to be critical. So I will connect you to that particular business. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Omar. I appreciate it. Welda, you want to talk about the housing work? Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to um, to explain what we've been doing with uh, the housing uh, counseling services in Baltimore City and with LEDC. Um, so as um, Marjorie mentioned, we are had a HUD approved housing counseling agency. So we provide all the uh, handholding that prospective first time home buyers need to, um, to become homeowners. Uh, we provide housing um, education and counseling the classes that are required for the down payment assistance programs in the area, uh, in Baltimore City, in Montgomery County, um, and in Washington, D.C., um, and Virginia. And um, additionally of that, we provide the one-on-one -on -one counseling sessions um, to analyze the individual situation of each of the, um, the attendees of to our classes. And in the one-on-one -on -one counseling sessions, our counselors um, evaluate their financial health, um, is what we like to call it. Uh, we pull the credit report, we support them to develop a household budget so they can understand where they are in that moment and uh, what is gonna be the work plan that they are gonna need to follow to accomplish their, their goal. And at, at the same as our um, colleagues in the small business department, we help them with the tools that we have available in house to build their credit if they need to establish their, their credit because as we know credit is one of the main components uh, when we want to become homeowners or do we want to or if we want to establish a small business um, so luckily we have um, our own um, tool that we can offer and the community can benefit from um, a, a credit builder loan with LEDC or participating in uh, one of the lending circles. Uh, that, that's another tool that we use uh, to support the community to establish their credit or to improve their credit if they are coming out of a difficult financial situation. We also provide foreclosure prevention counseling for existing homeowners, um, especially during this time, um, we are waiting for a wave of homeowners that are gonna be coming out of a forbearance period with their services. So we can provide um, assistance on the negotiation process with uh, the, um, the financial institutions that are holding their um, mortgage loans. And our more, more recent service that we incorporated to our, our programs is the eviction prevention or tenant services in Baltimore City. Uh, we've been working with tenants since the beginning of the year to provide case management and guide them in the process to apply for rental assistance programs 
um, the utility um, assistance program with the city as well. And we are gonna start soon also supporting them with the relocation program that uh, the CAP um, is gonna be launching soon. So we've been really um, busy working with, uh, with the Baltimore City area during this, um, this time and learning every day about the, their needs and, um, and working with them to, to provide the services they, they need. Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> um, so th these are really important um, initiatives that you've brought to Baltimore and really enhancing what's what's already here because we do have some groups that are doing this work, but you're, you're specializing really in the Latino community, but you're also seeing uh, clients from other communities, right? Yeah, so we are designed, you know, to serve the Latino community, uh, which serves a lot of other groups, right? So, and we don't turn anyone away um, because of their race and, and ethnicity. It's just um, obviously uh, discriminatory and not allowed. Right. And uh, we know that people, um, some folks prefer to work with us, right? Um, they feel safer with us than, than with uh, some more mainstream groups or uh, what other uh, alternatives are out there. And I think uh, we've established a pretty strong track record. We're one of the most productive um, nonprofits in the region. Um, so folks, uh, know that we will get things done with them. Uh, so yes, we, we serve everyone. Yeah. It's, and again, it's very exciting to have you in, in Baltimore. Uh, we met when I was in my previous role at the community development network, uh, a while ago. So <laughs> it's very exciting to, to have you, um, to have you here. And, um, I know, uh, you're, you're probably overloaded, but I could certainly use your help up here. <laughs> on Greenmount Avenue. And um, I mean, mm -hmm. our, our community is growing, right? You're already seeing that we're not just in South, our community is not just in Southeast anymore. Um, it's uh, coming here to Better Waverly and Coldstream Homes at Montebello. It's, you know, uh, my um, colleague um, in the 10th, in the 9th, and in the 7th, they just did a, a, a group, I think you all were involved in their um, uh, seminars and stuff for the Latino community there. Uh, so it's, you know, we're all over, which is great. Um, I, I fear that, uh, we, we're going to need to multiply you because, um, <laughs> because there's our, there's going to be so much need and, and we are, you know, by nature, Latinos are entrepreneurs, right? We have people who like to start up their business, be their own boss, do, you know, things innovatively. We have a lot of people in the, you know, landscaping and in the construction and in, you know, all kinds of different fields. And so I would imagine that your entrepreneurship services are going to be needed. Um, you know, you're probably already feeling that, <laughs> Omar, and everything that you're doing and trying to expand. Um, and then Walda with the um, housing counseling, especially since the, um, you know, the rental assistance work has been really important. Um, and then the you know, you, you said earlier that you're going to have, I think all of the housing counseling organizations are going to be super busy really soon because the forbearance is going away. Um, and the, the, the challenge is that the housing counselors all dismantled their foreclosure prevention apparatus to, you know, after the, the 2008 crisis, we're going to enter another one very quickly. Um, and so hopefully that, you know, uh, you're, <laughs> we'll get you more people to, to help out because uh, I know it's going to be a lot. Yes, we are, we've been waiting for that. Um, luckily, I would say something that, um, you know, this, the service industry, uh, they learned from the previous um, financial crisis and they've been, they've been more flexible this time. I would really? More open. Um, or at least that would be great. Bit. That would be great. <laughs> Yeah, they've, yeah. Been, they've been better prepared because um, we've been waiting for that wave of homeowners requesting assistance to, to negotiate or to, to get in contact with them. But services have been offering uh, easy access to, to send a message or to give them a call and explain that uh, as a homeowner, they have been impacted by, by the COVID um, health emergency. 
and with that they initiate the forbearance period, uh, process without requesting a ton of documents. So that has been good. But the, the problem is going to be now when that forbidden, forbidden period ends and when the um, foreclosure moratorium ends in locally, um, um, in the local area. So that is when um, the rush for us is going gonna, is gonna to start. Well, in, in Maryland, though, the unlike the eviction process, the foreclosure process is really long. Um, there were many of us that worked on that <laughs> so that, you know, we have more time for people to work things out. So I'm hopeful that that is going to be um, helpful um, as well. So, yes. And, and the, the, other, um, the other thing that is going to be good for homeowners, and we are waiting for that as well in, in Maryland, is uh, the uh, they have um, money, um, the um, uh, Homeowners Assistance Fund um, that is slowly starting in, in, in the area. We are entering a, in a pilot phase with DC, um, but we've been waiting for, for Maryland to hear how this gonna, is gonna work. Yeah, we, we do have the, um, what's it called? The, um, the fund that, you know, once you file foreclosure, the $300 goes into the, it's the homeowner um, housing counseling fund. I should know that. Um, so that'll help fund the organization. But as foreclosures went down, we didn't have the money. Now foreclosures are going up. And so it's it's a very interesting, but hopefully there's going to be, I haven't heard yet, but it sounds like you know that there will be some funding, relief funding available that we're going to have to roll out um, like we did with the eviction prevention work. Yeah, that is the fund that I mentioned. Okay. The homeowners assistant fund. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's through the treasury department. Um, yeah. And so what DC is doing is it's starting a pilot and they contracted LEDC uh, because of COVID and the need to deploy financial assistance really quickly, right, to community, to households, to small businesses, to nonprofits. Um, a number of local age, local government agencies reached out to us and asked us to assist them to deploy uh, funds as quickly as possible, right? So we actually stood up a new department that specializes in designing really low burden applications, right? Uh, so that money could get out really fast. And we also built the capacity to establish um, digital platforms to process the applications and deploy the money um, in really large batches. So we can deploy um, hundreds of grants per day, uh, millions of dollars, uh, so that it doesn't sit like the housing funds have sat, <laughs> right? And, and housing agencies have had a difficult time deploying them because they haven't contracted groups like us. But on the small business side, the agencies that work with small business um, have really understood that CDFIs exist and that we move really quickly and we're agile. Um, and so we've been able to you know, create a whole new department. I think we have about 10 people now in this department and they've deployed about 80 million so far on behalf of um, Montgomery County, DC, Fairfax, right? So the whole um, region has been hearing about this new capability that we have in contracting us to get dollars out as quickly as possible. And so. Um, this is the first time that a housing agency has reached out to us to help them deploy um, grant, you know, th these funds really quickly. So we'll be testing this out with um, DC government and we'll actually be leveraging infrastructure that was built during the Great Recession, right, to help um, pay lenders. So um, it, it's a really interesting project uh, and we'll see how it goes and um, hopefully it'll pick up steam and, and we'll be able to help other um, states and local governments deploy their housing funds because it's they've just been trapped and they haven't been able to design um, the appropriate processes. So. Yeah, we've, we've had to stay, I mean, Catalina knows, we had to stand up our own uh, whole apparatus uh, for the rental assistance. Um, I know Montgomery County and talking with the county executive basically just went through the uh, nonprofit organizations to try to get that out, um, similar to, to what you just talked about. So. Uh, yeah, that was, that's a lot. So what, uh, you know, and since we're talking about COVID um, a little bit, um, but, but it, you know, the other thing with LEDC that I, I always like is the flexibility. You see a need, you figure out what you need to do, <laughs> you make it happen, but it's all within, you know, the, the mission of the organization. So um, I think that flexibility is going to be critical as we get out of, you know, as we get out of, we're not out of it yet, um, COVID, but, um, you know, and helping people uh, recover, particularly, you know, related to the business side and also to the home ownership and rental side. So I do appreciate um, um, all of that. So um, 
Catalina, your office was instrumental in trying to help our community uh, get through COVID. Um, and um, not just with the food assistance and all of that, because there were so many people involved with that piece, but you know, translating documents, um, really making sure that people knew, hey, the community is really in need. I mean, our community was the hardest hit. And what's really interesting, and thanks to all of you and so many others who are have been out there doing this work, where the our the Latino community is the top community that's been vaccinated, right? So it's so interesting that we were the hardest hit, and now we're you know we still have more to go. We still need to vaccinate more people. I mean, at uh, Fiesta Latino, there were over a hundred people that were vaccinated, so that was a good thing. Um, so talk a little bit more, Catalina, about how your office managed the COVID issues. Yeah, during COVID, um, we adjusted our responsibilities and play a series of roles to respond to the needs of the community. And by the way, we are, we're the convener, we're the institutional glue. We wouldn't be able to do the work with our city, with our, uh, city agencies and nonprofits like LEBC who are nimble and are mm -hmm. able to serve people very quickly, which is something that we as government cannot do, right? Um, but our role was mainly around making sure that any messaging going out of the administration was translated in multiple languages, because it was a pandemic information was uh, receiving information and understanding information was a matter of life and death. And unfortunately, information was not translated from the state. So we had to make sure that we needed to translate information very quickly into the city's five core languages. We also make sure that the messaging that was going out was culturally appropriate. Uh, but in addition to that, if as government was moving away from in-person services and to over the phone and uh, via website, making sure that um, employees had access to telephonic interpretation to help people who couldn't, who couldn't speak English. Um, you know, in our traditional role as a, as a source of information, making sure that people had information so partnering with ethnic media, we also set up um, a number of communication channels. Uh, we still have a community stakeholder call. We do a weekly session in Spanish um, to talk about uh, changes in public services, uh, but also any information related to the pandemic. We have uh, we started out with a weekly report uh, just to keep people informed. Um, we also have a Facebook page where we send information on a daily basis in multiple languages. Another one of our roles as a technical assistance provider was making sure that as health and economic resources were being developed, that there were no barriers for our communities and essentially excluded from many of those resources. Unfortunately, when, when COVID happened, we were under the Trump administration, so many of the federal benefits were not available for individuals without status, uh, not even available for people who had U.S. citizen children. And so because of that, we, um, we implemented a cash assistance program to provide uh, financial assistance to families and individuals who live in the city of Baltimore, had a child, and uh, did not receive a stimulus check or any unemployment insurance because of their lack of status. Um, to this date, we've uh, assisted close to 3,000 households who still have the program. Um, and then finally, when, when COVID really hit the Latino community um, last summer, we created a, a strategy to increase uh, in-person outreach. So we subcontract with CASA to hire six community organizers that do weekly canvassing in various neighborhoods. And perhaps are responsible for, the, for, for, for some of the highest rates as it relates to COVID because what we realize is that, you know, folks, may not listen to government because they may be afraid of us, um, but also the in-person outreach is really critical for our community. Um, and more importantly, where that message comes from really, really is critical. Um, so they may not listen to us, but they may listen to CASA, they may listen to LEBC, uh, they may listen to their friends and family. Um, but in addition to having in-person outreach for Latinos, which con continues to exist to this day, um, we also created a case management program along with cash assistance, learning from our initial experience that during last summer, where a one-time payment was great, but people still had needs. Um, so the second round of the emergency relief for immigrant families, which is the program, incorporates a case management program where people not only receive a, a one-time payment, but they're also receiving 15 weeks of case management where they're connected to energy assistance, food, um, 
rental assistance, and SNAP, all with the idea that we're connecting them to more sustainable public benefits. Um, today, we're mainly focused on vaccination. Um, we are really lucky to have a very progressive um, health department, and they have been extremely open and willing to follow our recommendations. They've subcontracted with Esperanza Center and the International Rescue Committee uh, to have their own call center so people can call and register for the vaccine because many of the sites don't have language capacity. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we have a team of people that walk on a weekly basis, convincing people to get vaccinated. Um, and we have an amazing group of nonprofits that uh, during the pandemic really came together to assist the community uh, in any way possible, including LEDC. Yeah, it, it's pretty amazing how people have had to be completely innovative during this time of crisis. Um, and the partnerships was really important. Um, we have in my district, we have two grocery distribution sites and just everybody came together and said, this is what we got to do. And it's uh, pretty amazing. Um, so Marjorie or Omar or Walda, was there anything else you wanted to add about anything that um, LD, LEDC did uh, to change, grow, serve the community during the COVID crisis? Sure, yeah, I would say, um, I think the last uh, key piece is that we became a paycheck protection program lender, right? So we were- ah. That's right. Um, when, uh, we were actually the only nonprofit uh, small business lender um, on the ground, you know, community base that uh, was deploying this kind of uh, product. Uh, so uh, we had to move really quickly. Um, it was being built, right? They were building the plane as they flew it. Uh, so no one knew uh, who could actually get this designation or not, but we pushed uh, early on. Um, we didn't even have documentation to verify that we were a PPP lender and we were fundraising for it. So I was just forwarding emails, show it, you know, as documentation that we were a PPP lender to let, you know, to for banks to feel comfortable investing in us. Um, it was uh, pretty hairy at different points. Uh, we didn't even know how to use the SBA system, right? So I would say it wasn't even just about innovation. It's also about taking risks, right? And feeling comfortable taking risks. Um, and, 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 and we do, right? <laughs> So we just went in head first. We leveraged our personal networks to learn um, how to use all these systems. We fundraised $4 million in a matter of days um, and began deploying PPP loans um, as quickly as possible. And so Omar's team uh, did not sleep um, for many months, <laughs> uh, but uh, it, was, it was all well worth it. Um, we all learned um, so much and, and we know a lot of um, small business owners benefited um, from the work. So. Um, yeah, I really and that's going to enhance that's going to enhance just what you do anyway, right? Yeah. So that's really exactly. great. Go ahead, yeah. Walda. Yeah, I just would, would like to add that uh, another in innovation thing that we did is the incorporation of apps and new software to the services that we provide. Um, at least in the, I, I know my my colleagues in the small business and lending team probably they were more advanced at the housing side of the house, um, but with the housing counseling services. We had to take 20 something years of providing services in a one-on-one -on -one basis every day with classes and counseling um, to one day to the other to be virtual. So, um, but it has been good. It has been good um, for us. We uh, improve our services. Uh, we learn first uh, um, internally how to use all those apps so uh, we can teach now our clients so how to sign a document using uh, uh, Adobe Sign, how to receive a document on their on their cell phone, and you know uh, click on, on a link and open the document and sign the document. So you can send those documents back to us, and we can help you to get the cash assistance, for example, in 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 Baltimore City, or to continue receiving um, uh, their rental assistance uh, to uh, to avoid eviction. So. That is something uh, that we did that differently one day to the other. And we've been learning um, to be able to continue supporting our community and helping them move forward because we don't want them to stay there. We want them to continue moving with us uh, so they can get access to, to, those, to those services. Yeah, that's just totally amazing what, what you all, all of you have been able to do in this very short amount of time. 
to meet the needs um, and it's gonna continue to grow, I think. Um, so this is Hispanic Heritage Month and I wanted to ask each of you, um, you know, when we talk about Hispanic Heritage Month, it's, you know, about our heritage, it's about our history. Um, and it's also just lifting up uh, the work, you know, that's that's being done in our community. So um, I wanted to ask each of you, who, who influences you? Who do you look up to in our community that influences you to, to do the, the work that you're doing? Um, I guess it doesn't have to always be our community, but you know, it's Hispanic Heritage Month, so uh, it could be somebody in Baltimore, it could be whoever. Um, I talk often about my uh, great grandmother um, who, uh, when um, she's, my family's from Puerto Rico, and so she, um, her name was Ricarda Lopez, and she, uh, when, when women got the right to vote in the US, that did not count in Puerto Rico because Puerto Rico is not a state, right? It was a territory. So she was one of the leaders of the suffrage movement to make sure that women in Puerto Rico and the other territory, colonies, territories, take your pick, um, were given the right to vote. So, um, and then she ran for governor of Puerto Rico. And um, my dad talks about stories of how, as she aged, he would take her to the voting booth and she would tell everybody how to vote, which you're not allowed to do. <laughs> And he was so embarrassed. Um, but anyway, I never got to meet her, but she uh, has been, um, you know, certainly influential in my family's life. And, you know, uh, when uh, she was the only person in our family that had run for office. So when I decided to run, actually, I think it was like in seventh grade, my dad was like, oh man. <laughs> so she's exactly like Mamita is what they called her. And so um, anyway, so I always uh, like to look up and, and learn more about her and, and other um, people that are uh, have been influential, but there's so many of us that have made such an impact um, in, our, in our community. Um, so Catalina, who inspires you in our community? Um, so growing up, I would say my father, um, you know, as an immigrant, I became Hispanic at the age of 20 when I moved here. <laughs> uh, I, it, it's a very foreign concept. I am right. an immigrant first. Uh, but today, uh, you know, I, I get really inspired by the people that I get to serve. Uh, from the business owner who, you know, first moved to Chicago and they came here to open a business and is thriving to the lady that I met last week, um, whose husband had passed away from COVID, but she was at the school fair, making sure that her children had all the, all the information. Um, I get inspired by their stories, uh, their resilience, and it really puts things in, into perspective for me whenever I get bogged down by the bureaucracy that our community is extremely resilient and perseveres. And um, if they can make it, so can I. Yes, definitely. All the people that have been, um, you know, going through so much also are very inspiring because, you know, it's it's their stories that I think keep all of us going um, that, you know, this work is so, is so important. Marjorie, how about you? Sure. Um, so I, I'm surrounded, fortunately, with really strong Latina women um, in my family. And so I draw a lot of inspiration by then. My mother, um, you know, was born in the early 40s and was not expected to work, but she was a, like a self-appointed um, social worker in our community. So <laughs> anytime a new immigrant family came in, they found her, she found them and she took them wherever they needed to go to get whatever they needed, right? So I saw her doing that um, early on. Um, and then I would say actually uh, my colleagues, right? Uh, at LEDC, we've just been so fortunate to have just really high caliber Latinos. Um, and so I've just always felt really proud to work with really smart, really hardworking, the smartest people I've worked with, um, I've worked with at LEDC. So, uh, hey colleagues, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, but I think they keep me going. Um, and, uh, obviously our, our clients, um, and their incredible stories. So. Yeah, it's, it's so amazing to work with awesome people um, and, and the chemistry is there and you just have one single focus and that's what you do. So that, that's awesome. Omar, how about you? I, I also uh, share the sentiment with Catalina and Marjorie that I uh, inspired by my clients. So I, I was lucky because I started at LEDC in 2017 as a business coach in Baltimore. 
And now I'm also uh, overseeing the lending department I, and I get to read the credit memos from uh, former clients and I see how they are growing and I see their financial and I'm very uh, proud of them. Uh, yeah, my clients. Yes, it's awesome to see people uh, being able to get the help and then, you know, uh, survive and, and thrive. Um, so yeah, that's, that's amazing. You're lucky that you get a chance to do that because a lot of times, a lot of people help people, but they don't see like what the result is, you know, sometimes you lose touch. Um, so it's really great to be able to, to see that. Yeah, it's very rare. So you're very, you're lucky that you're able to do that. Walda? Um, yeah, I would say that um, before coming to the United States, I came here um, in 2000. Before that, um, my inspiration was my mom. Um, and uh, it's until now that she's no longer with us that I recognize that she was an entrepreneur all her life. Um, I grew in, um, in a small town in Guatemala and uh, she was a single mother um, all her life. And um, she, uh, always provide for us and, and provide the best education that she could that opens me the doors coming to this country um, and also gave me the opportunity to, to work for our community. And, um, and now that I've been here, I, I also will say that uh, my co-workers at LDC, um, I've been with the organization for 15 years and I feel that every day is the first day because we are always doing something new, we are always improving, we are always taking new initiatives. Um, if there is something that needs to be done for the community, we say, we are gonna do it. Uh, I, we don't know how, but we're gonna do it. So um, definitely working at LDC um, is, is, is being my motivation during this time as an immigrant in the United States and, and having the privilege to serve our community day by the every day and every day and yeah that keeps keeps me going thank you very much for sharing i really really appreciate it um so we're gonna uh wrap up but just uh one sort of last piece about you know what what do you think about um you know the fact that our population is growing and our our community is growing um it it really seems to me like we have an opportunity um to make really a significant impact i mean let's not talk about all the amazing food that's about to go all over baltimore okay <laughs> um but you know our culture our music we just you know saw a lot of that the last you know few weeks and also at uh, fiesta baltimore um but you know how do you think that will be um or what do you see as the future for our community here in baltimore i mean i think I i'm i talk about being the first elected um official that's of Hispanic descent, but I'm certainly not going to be the last. So I think I see where, you know, I think that there are already, I mean, a lot of uh, people very interested in trying to uh, make a difference in our community. Um, but uh, yeah, how do, how do you see this working for us? I mean, it sounds like we're going to be growing pretty substantially in the next 10 years as well and, and making an impact. So, you know, tell, tell me a little bit about what you think is going to happen with the community, but we also still have a lot of needs. I mean, we have the same, you know, needs that everybody else does, right? We want good schools for our kids. We want, you know, a decent job to pay the bills. We want to live in a safe neighborhood. Uh, we want, um, you know, sort of all of those things um, in addition to being able to make an impact, right? So I think it's, um, so I, I don't know where, where we head from here, but uh, I am going to be actually working on legislation in the next year um, to allow for those who are non-citizens to vote in our local election. Um, I think that's, I think that's a big deal, right? To have the uh, um, voting uh, influence. Um, Prince George's does this, some towns in Prince George's do it. Um, and so I thought we should try it here. Um, it'll be controversial, I know, but I mean, <laughs> I think it's important to do. Uh, so I do see that we're also gonna grow in terms of, um, you know, po political influence. And um, I think that's, uh, that's a good thing to have, you know, more than just a two way conversation that we're going to have, you know, a multi language, multicultural conversation around, you know, how we do this work in our city. So that's, how I think where it's where it's going to head. So Catalina, what do you think? 
Well, let me know when you introduce the bill. I will support you <laughs> in any way possible. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because I, I do think that that will give our community a voice uh, that's, that's very important. You know, I think for us, we've seen consistent growth of Latinos over the last 20 years. Um, I don't think our issue has been attracting Latinos and immigrants. I think our issue is retaining communities, uh, which is the case for many other communities. I think the way where we can grow our community and, and, and fully support it is by strengthening the existing infrastructure that is going to give them a reason to buy a house. So programs like LEDC, that's going to give them the tools to open a business, programs like LEDC. You know, how do we strengthen the infrastructure for them to have a reason to stay in our city that other counties don't offer? I think those are the things that we need to be building in our city. So strengthening the infrastructure of our agencies, but also the nonprofit, nonprofits that are in some cases better equipped to serve our communities. Absolutely, yes. Marjorie, I, I think your office is mostly in DC, but you're familiar with Baltimore. So I would imagine you, and the changes that we've seen in DC, I think are actually gonna happen here too, don't you think? Yeah, I mean, it's we've been in Baltimore since 2014, so about seven years. Um, and so our, our team has been growing um, in Baltimore. Uh, and yeah, it's really interesting, right? Because we're in very different markets, right? So DC, Northern Virginia is pretty far gone on the gentrification side. Um, and then we have Puerto Rico, you know, with really high poverty rates. Um, uh, uh, I guess... Uh, maybe almost like a stagnant economy, right? And, and Baltimore is, I think, a little further ahead than that, where um, I think Baltimore is getting its sea legs. Um, and I think that um, that COVID, from what we've seen, has really pushed um, service providers to collaborate, right? To really think about how can we come together? And I know Catalina um, spearheaded a project with us, with a number of other nonprofits in the city um, for a really big opportunity. Um, which uh, is not easy to do, to get you know, all these different service providers around the table to agree to do a project together for you know, a significant amount. Um, and so uh, it's, it's been really inspiring. I think um, that Baltimore has really unique people um, in government who genuinely care, right? Um, have even pushed us, right? And, and inspired us um, to, to step up our game and, and really start working together. Uh, so, I'm looking forward to, to see what happens um, through these collaborations um, that are being um, fed by folks like Catalina and, and her colleagues in government. So um, yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunity and uh, really interesting um, policy changes um, that the city's looking at that we can leverage. Yeah, I think we're, we're at an interesting place just citywide. Um, uh, I've been challenging, Catalina knows this, I've been challenging the, the administration to think think big about this, you know, federal money that's coming. Like, you know, yes, we have people, you know, applying for different, but like, let's think big. Let's take a big thing that, you know, we need. Okay, so I'm a housing person. So I decided to tell them that I think that we need to, you know, really tackle, you know, what the, the conditions in East and West Baltimore. I mean, you know, we're not going to reduce the crime. We're not going to deal with drug, all of that stuff. We're not going to deal with unless we have stable um, housing for people and we get rid of the vacant properties. So that's the big thing that I proposed. Whether he does that or not, I don't know. But I think it's. Uh, but your point is is right in that there. They, I think the administration actually is trying to think of what is the the big things that we should be doing with this opportunity. Right, um, which is a sort of a double-edged sword. It's not a great opportunity, you know. We shouldn't have had COVID, but here we are, and now we've got this opportunity. So it's it's just a, very interesting, and the fact that the, the mayor is actually thinking very differently about uh, crime prevention and equity is something that we haven't seen ever. So I mean, I'm I'm excited about it, but we have to continue to push because we have to continue to make sure that our community is absolutely included in those um, conversations. So, yeah, yeah, it's very interesting. Omar, how about you? You see see some good things coming for us? Definitely. Yeah, I think as the, not just the population growing, but also getting um, more educated, um, more empowered, we are gonna see uh, that 
Latinos are not just uh, dominating the traditional industries like food, uh, beauty, uh, construction, but they are going to start incursionating in more like high value services and also participating in more procurement with the government, et cetera. Yeah, that's a good point too, in that um, I've had some people come and say, well, I want to work with uh, Latino organizations to work directly with the Latino community. And I said, well, you know, sometimes we need to get into organizations where we're not so that we can be, you know, in inserting ourselves as Latinos in the conversation, right? So, you know, going away from the traditional industries and working on other industries where we're, we're not always there, but that that is something that is, is important. I think that's, I think that's going to happen more often as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I've had some Latino students say, oh, I want to work with so-and-so, you know, Centro Sol. And I said, great, those are great organizations, but how about you work with ROCA? Or how about you work with, you know, these other organizations that still don't have uh, Latinos there, but need to. So let's insert ourselves into the conversation. So, yeah, I think that that's, I think that's a, that's an important um, piece as well. So yeah, thanks for, for bringing that up. Walda, how about you? What do you think about how things are going and will go? I, I like your uh, your point of asking new generations to be ambassador ambassadors of our community of our community with other sectors. That that's that's awesome. Keep keep working on that. Um, in terms of um, our community, I will say that I, I I hope and I I I believe that more growing is is coming in all the areas because. Uh, I had the opportunity these two past weekends to be in uh, uh, two community events. One was the Somos Baltimore Latino uh, anniversary. And the, um, on Sunday, I was at uh, uh, Fiesta Baltimore. And um, I will say from six of 10 people that passed through our, uh, our, our table, they all asked for our small business uh, information. They have. They want to be um, uh, their own bosses. They want to establish a, a new business. Um, so I, I, I know that a lot of growing in that area is coming. But also in terms of the financial health of our families, they are learning more about uh, taking care of their um, their budget, their household budget. They are going to be learning more about credit, um, which are the keys to open the doors. Um, those doors that they want to open, if they want to buy a house, that they want to be entrepreneurs, they want to send their children to, to school. Um, so definitely, I, I see that the community is learning about the wonderful services that they have available. Um, there's still a lot that we have to do in terms of reaching out to the community and letting them know that we are there, all the organizations, um, so they can take advantage of the services. But once they learn, once they know, um, I know that they are going to grow. And we are going to have more homeowners investing in, in their communities. Yes, well, thank you all for being here and for sharing all the great work that you're doing. Um, a lot of ideas popping in my head about how we can do more, you know, partnership, not like you need more work to do. Um, but <laughs> uh, there's, there's so much that can be done for our community and for our city. Um, and um, I'm just thrilled that LADC is here. And Catalina, thank you for everything that you've been doing. And all of you, thank you so much. Um, and for our audience, thank you for being with us. Um, we had a lot of people on Facebook today. Um, and uh, our next town hall um, is next week. Uh, we're working out the fine details of that. Um, after that, we will have um, DOT. So we'll start to talk with DOT. That's going to be a popular one, um, and um, and then the um, mayor's office of children and family success. So we've got some good town halls coming up. Um, and again, I just want to remind you: uh, get vaccinated. If you haven't been vaccinated, there are you know lots of ways to do that. Those of you who've already been vaccinated with the Pfizer and have been vaccinated for six months, like me, I got to get my booster. Um, especially since I'm out and about all the time, so um, I have to do that. And then. You know, we'll uh, we'll we'll get out of this thing at some point, so we'll figure it out. But I do appreciate everybody being here. Thanks to to our guests for everything that you do and for taking the time on a Wednesday evening after a long day uh, to be with us. I really really appreciate it. So just want to say good night and thank you. We'll see you next time. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.